I learned recently that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who send their food back to the kitchen and people who don't. There are people who say, I didn't want that cheese on the salad. Take it back. I wanted my steak medium rare, not medium. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it back. I'm not the send it back type. I just want it fast. Get it in front of me. It'll be fine. I'm a little bit nervous about sending food back because I've heard stories about what the cooks do in the kitchen if you send the food back. And, and so I, I, just, I just take it as it is. Um, we took Alex Seeley. Wasn't she amazing last week? We took, we took Alex to lunch after the service last week and went to a very nice restaurant in Dallas. And um, she, she sent her food back. Um, it, it looked fine to me, but not, not to Alex. It wasn't the way she ordered it. Um, and so she just, she just sent it back. Beck and I felt awkward, awkward. We had our food. We were eating our food. She was just sitting there. She, she, she was participating in the conversation. Way didn't seem to bother her that she didn't have any food. We were just feeling a, a little uncomfortable. But the more I thought about it, the more that's pretty impressive, actually, that, that she put her will forward um, in, in such a tangible way. Um, I, I'm, I was impressed with her. She was very clear-minded about avocado toast. I mean, you guys, she had, a, she had pictures from Australia of what good avocado toast looked like. She had an she had a understanding of avocado toast, and, and so she, she sent it back. And, and I'd like to say it like this, because she had a vision for her meal. Uh, she's like, if this meal costs as much as the menu says, it cost, then I'm going to receive what was paid for. I'm going to receive what was promised. She knew how it was supposed to look. She had a vision. She was willing to wait. She was willing to be inconvenienced. I love her attitude now. It's like, no, this is what I want, and this is what I'm going to get. I'm describing a sender. For those of you who fit into that category of like, yeah, I always send my, send my food back. Um, you might find comfort in knowing so is God. God is a sender. God sends stuff. He sent his only begotten son. Then Jesus sent his spirit. And then the spirit sends us. God is ascending God. You want to just say it out loud, get it in the atmosphere? God is ascending God. Why does he sin? Because he's very clear-minded about what he wants. He's very clear-minded about the vision of how the world is supposed to look. And so sending is the activity of heaven that makes us sure that God is going to get what God wants. Sending is the activity that assures us that God's vision is actually going to come to pass. You're like, well, why doesn't God just get in the kitchen and take care of things for himself? He's God, after all, because God carries integrity. And way back in the Garden of Eden, he spoke his word, and he says, from now on, the humans are going to have dominion over the earth. Therefore, it requires humans to heal the broken world. That's why Jesus was fully human, not just fully God, because it takes humans to heal the broken places of the earth. So what is God up to? He is loving and local humans who will receive his blessing and then he sends those humans with his blessing to extend his blessing to all the nations of the earth. What is God up to? He's locating loving humans who will receive his blessing so that the blessing then can be distributed to every location of the earth. Therefore, the question of every believer is not, will I participate in his sending strategy, but how will I participate in his sending strategy? You see, I love this paragraph of Scripture, Acts 13, the text. It's so amazing. I love this Antioch church. It's fabulous. I want to be like the Antioch church. First of all, they love to bless other people. Paul has just returned from 
giving an offering to the poor in Jerusalem. He had, he had visited the church in Jerusalem, and so, and so he, he, he had collected a lot, of, a lot of money, and he's helping the poor people at, at Jerusalem. Not only that, I like Antioch because it's got some fiery prophets right in the middle there. The, the names of the prophets are there. Uh, there's Barnabas. There's Simeon, who is called Niger. There's Lucius of Cyrene. There's Manain. And I love his biography. He grew up with Herod, the Tetrarch. Uh, that doesn't mean anything to you. Remember Herod, he cut off the head of John the Baptist. Herod, the terrorist. Herod, the baddest person in all the land. And he grew up with the baddest person in all the land. Someone told me the other day, yeah, it was the way I grew up. That's why, that's why I behave the way I behave, because of my bad upbringing. And, and I just need to tell somebody today, it's time to stop letting your history dictate your present and your future, because this gospel is bigger than your bullies. This gospel is not limited by bad relationships or bad rulers. This is a powerful gospel. And so... Um, there's Manin's little testimony right in the middle of the story. I love this church, Antioch, because it's a diverse church. They, they are understanding that participation with God is not limited to any particular ethnicity. And that's a big deal because to this point, it's only been the Jewish people who have been stewards of the gospel. You can tell by the names that these are people from different countries. They're from, they all have different ethnicities. And it's a worshipful church. Not only are they singing songs, but verse 2 says they ministered unto the Lord. They, they, they literally are discharging regular duties of life. They're ministering unto the Lord. They're, they're, they're designing dresses. They're building their cabinets. They're teaching their classrooms. They're doing it with an understanding that the reason they're doing it is because they see a lot of worth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I want to be part of a church It is all about, yeah, the Lord ministers to us, but there's a shift sometimes in the well-being of a church where they're not only saying, Lord, would you minister to me, but then it becomes an attitude where the church is saying, Lord, I want to minister to you. Everything I do needs to be as unto you. And so this is a church that has learned not only to celebrate the ministry of the Lord, but they're ministering, they're ministering to the Lord as well. I love this church. I want to be like this church because they fasted. The Bible says they fasted. Now, why did they fast? Well, fasting is what I do when I feel like God is about to give us a breakthrough, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. Fasting is a, is a way that my life gets focused. Fasting is a way that it's kind of like when... I hate to keep using my dog in illustrations, but sometimes the hair on the back of his neck will just stand up and you know a squirrel is nearby somewhere, you know, and I feel that way in the spirit realm sometimes. And when I feel like I don't know what God is going to do, but I know he's about to do something, I'll be honest with you, I'm living that way right now. I'm living with a, a, a little bit of some, some, some stimulation in my spirit, some expectation, some anticipation. Something is, un, come on, something is cooking in heaven's kitchen. And, and, and I believe, I'm prophesying, some of the bad things are about to break and some of the good things are about to be released in the earth. But fasting gets you ready for all that. You see, fasting, fasting gets you focused. But, but all of those things going on in this church, here's the... Here's the secret superpower of that amazing church in Antioch. This is what made the church famous. This is the legacy of the Antioch church. And, and I'll just read it. I read it before, but let me read it again. Verse 2 says, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them. Yeah. Can you, can you feel the rumble in that verse? Can you feel the power associated with that simple paragraph? Because something is happening in Antioch that has not happened anywhere else in the history of God's church. This is a pioneer thing. It's the very first time God is sending some people because God is saying, hey, gang, what is in Antioch cannot stay in Antioch. We have to move it. We have to export it. We have to expand it. So the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, separate these guys 
from the regular worship routines and put them into the work, put them into the workmanship that I have prepared for them. I have called them to, to do this. So I like to break this down into three little, little ideas. Here's the first. I, I notice when I read this that there's a sending sound. There's a sending sound. There's a enunciation. There's an awareness. There's a, there's a hearing going on in the church. There's a stirring. You could, this is not normal routine. There's, oh, 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 something's going on. And, and it's built around this phrase, I have called them. I've called them. Yeah. I learned about calling as a little boy in Montgomery, Alabama. We had lots of kids my age in the neighborhood, seven, eight years old, and, and we all had bicycles. And so when we got home from school, you know, it was, let's go find where the baseball game is. Let's go find out. We do more stickball than baseball, to be honest about it. Let's go, find, let's go find where the football game is. And sometimes it would be blocks and blocks away from my house where the location of the, of the game was. But no matter how far away I was from home, about 5.30 in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, didn't matter, about 5.30 in the afternoon, it was my responsibility to be close enough to my house to hear the call. I had to hear the call. I tried to imitate the call in the first service, but my mom was in the service and it just didn't go well, so I'm not going to try to imitate it here. Sometimes it was my dad, but mostly it was my, my mom. Jim! I, see, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't imitate it. But... But when I heard the call, the game stopped. When I, when I heard the call, um, it was time to separate myself from eight-year-old afternoon activities. Something bigger was going on. Now, I, I don't want you to feel like the call was a sad thing. No, no, it was joyful. It was a joyful thing because, well, sometimes it was a little sad because we, I was up to bat or whatever and I wanted to finish the game. But sometimes it was good because we were losing the game and as soon as the call came, I would say, oh, we can't finish, got to go. You know, we have to stop right where we are. We'll pick it up later on. But I knew that at the other end of the call, supper was waiting. I don't know if you guys have ever had my mother's cooking, but I'm going to tell you, it, 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 it's worth riding your bike a few blocks for. At the end of the call, I knew the routine. I'd get there, we would sit down, we would have a meal, and, and we would sit together. We would talk about school, we would talk about baseball, we would talk about whoever the president of the United States was at that time. We would talk about Jesus, we would talk about the University of Alabama football. And I, as an eight-year-old, felt pretty included. I felt pretty important. I felt like I was involved. And I'm trying to just illustrate for you that the call is about belonging. The call is about identity. The call came. Do you understand this? Because I had a family. Family, because I had a home, because I had a place. And Luke is recording the sound that sent Barnabas and, and, and Paul. He says the sound, let's just call it a call, because that's the sound that activated the whole journey uh, for the Antioch church. You see. Have you heard the sending sound? Have you, have you been able to to say yes to the, to the call. You see, I'm thinking about Isaiah. Isaiah one day was just in a church service, normal, regular temple experience, but all of a sudden the presence of the Lord came and, oh my goodness, it wasn't just another talk about God. It was actually an encounter with God. There, there he was in, in the temple on the Lord's day and, and the glory of the Lord began to swirl throughout the location where Isaiah was with God. I don't know if you've had that kind of an experience with God where it's not just studying God or talking about God or praying to God. There's an actual engagement of the glory. Has that happened to you? The glory of God. The resurrection presence. It happened to Isaiah, the living God. He met the living God and, 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 and he received a cleansing Isaiah is like, oh, woe is me. I'm in the presence of God. I'm undone. I'm undone. And God says, don't worry. I'll take care of it. And he sent an angel and he took a coal off the altar and he brought the coal and he put it on Isaiah's lips and it cleansed his lips. And, and that was what Isaiah needed. He needed to be clean in the presence of the Lord. But 
But it was a real, I'm trying to say it was a real encounter with God. Oh, church, we have to have that. We have to have those real encounters with God. And, and, and after the moment, God is sharing his secrets with Isaiah. He's like, oh, Isaiah, I just wish there was someone that I could send. I wish there was someone that would go to the people of Israel. I wish there was some. Their hearts are so hard and they're so stubborn and they're so set in their ways. It probably won't even do any good if I were to send someone. But, but I still wish someone would go for me. That's where the song came from. I wish someone would go for, for us. And Isaiah, having had this encounter with the living God, he's like, wait a minute. And he says, here am I. Send me. I hear your heart, Father. I, I embrace the call. I'll make new decisions about the way I was planning my life to go because I've encountered you, because I've embraced your passion for the world. And again, I don't know if there's anyone in the 11 o'clock service that has ever met with God in a way that grips your heart like that, that, that just causes you to be undone from all the things that you had planned or intended, that, that it just it astonishes you, oh, I never knew this part of God, but, but what happens when you meet God in a real way, in that kind of, of a way, it turns you into a person who begins to care about the things that God cares about. It, it, it changes your mentality from, I wonder what's in this for me, to a brand new mentality that says, where can I go, and what can I give, and what can I do to extend to others what has come to me? And Isaiah didn't really care about much about the inconvenience or the, or the results. He just wanted to be available to what God imagined for the world and for his own life. And so this is what the call of God feels like. It's a clear doctrine in the New Testament, not just a one-time experience for Isaiah. It's a clear doctrine. Everyone who literally belongs to God, if you belong to God, you've been called by God. I'm going to say it again because some of you don't believe it. If you testify, I belong to God. If you sing songs, I belong to God, then you, sir, have been called by God. If you belong to God, you've been called by God. First Corinthians 1 says Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, to the church of God in Corinth, to those who are called to be sanctified, called to be saints, with all who in every other place call on the name of the Lord Jesus on the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. Ephesians 4, 1 says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. I feel like on this first Sunday of November, when we're beginning an emphasis on reaching the world with the gospel, God wants me to tell us again that it is time for us to deal with the reality of our calling. God has sent a sound from the heavens into the earth, and it's for us. And I know that we prefer to be in charge of our own life. I know that we prefer to just add a little bit of belief to a, a moral lifestyle and call that Christianity but I'm here to remind you that being called means that God has a liberty over your life. He has established you for a purpose and a place that's bigger than your playground. Come on, somebody. Called means the Father has engineered your life and arranged your circumstance to advance his vision through your life. Called means you've been blessed to be a blessing. Called means that you are qualified to uniquely stop some aspect of the groaning that's in the world. Wow. Yeah. And I've come to ask you not to miss this part of the Christian joy. Don't miss this part of Christian joy. This is the reason that you're not in heaven today after you've been saved. This is the reason that you've received divine favor and divine nature. You are not a floating piece of protoplasm. You are not an orphan in need of a purpose. You are not a customer of God or a client of the church. You have been formed and chosen and predestined and justified and glorified to be sent as a specific poem. Poem. And that's the original word, 
poeme. Um, it's translated as God's workmanship. You're created as God's workmanship, his poem, his masterpiece. You are being created as his masterpiece to be sent um, because God wants to display his glory through your story. I don't know if you can hear what I've been hearing the last few days, but God is calling his church. There's a sound. He's calling his church once again to prevail against the gates of hell. And there's going to be a people who have encountered God in such a way that all we know to say is, God, hear him, I send me. Hear him, I send me. So, so this story begins with a sending sound, but would you notice, please, the sending voice? The sending voice, the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said. Did you know the outcomes of your life are determined by who speaks to you? Yeah, yeah. Whose voice influences you the most? Um, I, I had a conversation with President George Bush one time, a private, personal conversation. He, it was a personal word. He shared something. I shared something. And it actually influenced the way I voted for a number of elections just because I, I thought it was a big deal. And some of you are like, you just checked out if you know that I voted for George Bush or whatever. But I'm just saying, I thought, I thought the voice of George Bush was a pretty big deal. But can I remind you that the Holy Spirit's voice is a bigger deal than any politician or any ruler. And he is still speaking to his people today. There's a voice that we can hear today. And I'm just going to ask again, whose voice is the most important? Whose voice matters to us? Who, who's, which voice guides your life? This Antioch church clearly prioritizes conversations with the Holy Spirit. It would be one thing if Paul and Barnabas decided on their own, you know, we should go, we should go do this. Let's go take a survey and see which cities are, are the most uh, ready to receive the gospel. Let's, let's form a 10-year plan for the Antioch church. Let's hire consultants. Let's, let's develop, you know, personality assessments so we can see who's really best suited to be sent to, to the islands and those, those kinds of, we have to do. If Peter had said it, it would have been important. He was the, he was the leader of the church. If James had said it, it, it would have been important, but but I'm trying to get the church today to realize that this idea of sending didn't really originate in any human heart at all. I, I'm all for personality assessments and all kinds of, let's do everything we can. But you need to know that the sending idea came right out of heaven and it was breathed into the cognitive domain of human beings by the Holy Spirit. His voice, his idea. And if we don't realize that the Holy Spirit is involved in the idea of sending, then we might not respect it as a credible arena of participation for the church. We may think missions is for somebody else and not for us. If the Holy Spirit said it, do we get to debate it? If the Holy Spirit said it, do we get to vote on it? Do we get to ignore it? Do we get to delay it? The, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit said, I need to send some people to a place so they can hear the gospel. And come on, if the Holy Spirit is involved in it, it's going to generate righteousness and peace and joy. It's going to create a new authority of peace, a government that ever increases in the peace of the Lord. But it needed to be said by the Holy Spirit because sending is risky business. Abraham was sent, but he turned out not to be that reliable. And of course, then he was later on. Jonah was sent, but he didn't like the people he was sent to. Uh, John the Baptist was sent, but when he got arrested and was in jail, he began to lose doubt about the revelation he had if Jesus was actually the Christ. Moses was sent, but he didn't feel qualified to set 
the captives free. The disciples were sent, but they all ran like little girls when Jesus was arrested by the Roman soldiers. But church, if the Holy Spirit said it, let me say it like this, because the Holy Spirit said it, riskiness gets mitigated. Come on. If the Holy Spirit says it, the success rate is going to be higher than if human ingenuity had thought of this. If the Holy Spirit has said it, he's going to own the idea. And when he says it, when he says it, he engages the sending strategy with supernatural power. I'm just trying to say that, that wherever they were sent in their human weakness, Weakness began to show up. That became the occasion for the supernatural capacity of the Holy Spirit to come in and give strength to the place of witness. So whoever is sent by the Holy Spirit can be sure that the Holy Spirit is going to help us out. I'm just trying to say that even though we're sent, we're never sent on our own. Never sent by ourselves. We're sent with the mind of the Spirit. We're sent with the words of the Spirit and the ways of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. Come on, if the Holy Spirit is involved, then we can be sure that the unseen is going to interact with the seen. We can be sure that the divine and the human are simultaneously in your business location, simultaneously in your coffee shop, simultaneously in your classroom. I mean, what are we actually talking about here? What do you think is going to happen when Paul and Barnabas get hands laid on them, leave the confines of the local church, and they start going from city to city? city? What's going to happen in Ephesus? What's going to happen in Corinth? What's going to happen in Galatia? Well, Paul might just start teaching in a synagogue because that's a natural thing. That's a good idea. He knows he'll have an opportunity to say words in the synagogue. But do you, when you read the stories, every place that they went began with a human natural level, but it wasn't long before the human was interrupted by the spiritual, by the supernatural. It wasn't long before. Come on, church. Every place they went, there was a revival. There was a demon cast out. There was a reformation. Everywhere they went, the glory of God came to visit because they had been sent by the Holy Spirit. Someone told me the other day that we emphasize the Holy Spirit too much in our church. They did. Like, why don't you talk about Jesus more? You talk about the Holy Spirit all the time. And I try to be really nice to people like that. But, and I am usually, and I just said, you are the silliest person I have ever met. <laughs> How silly do you, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit manifests Jesus. Jesus says, it's better for you that I go back to heaven so that I can send the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit can start sending others. I've already been sent. I was sent by my Father, and the Holy Spirit came on me. But now I'm going back so that the Holy Spirit can send you and you and you and you and you and everyone that is going to be sent. I will breathe my Spirit into them. I will breathe into them, and they shall be sent sent just explains my life I didn't pray to move to Cedar Hill I was sent I don't have time to put up with your foolishness I've been sent don't expect me to spend two hours on the telephone talking to you about your Aunt Flossie's what, gerbils or flower garden or whatever. I don't have time for that. I've been sent. Come on, somebody. I don't get to plan my schedule. I don't get to plan my, my, my budget or how to spend my money. I've been sent by the Holy Spirit. I know you don't always agree with the way I do things, but I can't let you stay upset at me. We've been sent. I can't live in the offense that you sent my way. I've been sent. I've been called. I've had the Holy Spirit. My lips have been cleansed. I have a purpose to my life. And I'll just say, I'm not scared because I've been sent. I've been breathed on. I've been predestined for this. 
God's making, he's making a masterpiece which displays his glory. And we are a part of that poem that the world needs to hear. And then I'll just close with this. There's a sending sound, there's a sending voice, there's a sending structure. Now verse 3 says, they sent them away. Verse 4 says, so being sent by the Holy Spirit. They, they sent them, the, the prophets, uh, Simeon, Barnabas, Menain, they sent them away. So being sent by the Holy, who sent them? Who sent them? The Holy Spirit sent them, or did they send them? And the first place that they're sent to is a place called Silencia, and then they go to Cyprus. Not much happened in either of those places, Silencia or Cyprus. And I, I just want to ask you not to get too discouraged if not much happens at the first place you're sent, because it's just the first place you're sent. There's more to your life than the first place that you've been sent to. But after the first place, they go to the second place, and this is the island of Paphos, and we read it. There's an influential nobleman there named Sergius Paulus. And he's almost ready to embrace the gospel. But there's a sorcerer. There's a sorcerer. His name is Elimus. Boy, I just feel like I want to speak to sorcerers today. Get your hands off our kids. So there's a sorcerer, and his name is Elimus. His name literally means withstood. So Elimus withstood them. And, and I know that there are some people who think, well, I must not be sent if I'm being withstood. But actually being withstood is probably proof that you've been sent. And verse 9 says, Paul, then Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you fraud, you pervert. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. You enemy of God. I want you to go blind. And he did. He did. The dude went blind. And the Bible says, um, then the proconsul believed when he saw what, he had been, what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. <laughs> I, I bet he was ready to believe. Let me ask you a question. How did Paul think of blindness? How did he think of that? Because in the Old Testament, that, that never happened. In the Old Testament, there were hemorrhoids. Like, you disobeyed. You get hemorrhoids. <laughs> Come on. Who's, who's thankful to be living in the New Testament? <laughs> if you have hemorrhoids today, we'll pray for you at the end of the service, but we'll do it. And there was leprosy in the Old Testament. Like, there was leprosy if there was disobedience. But we got blindness. Paul's like, no, I want, you to be, I want you to be blind. How did he think of blindness, don't we know? It's because he was familiar with blindness. If you know Paul's story, it's because Paul actually needed blindness for a season in order to be able to see. Yeah, yeah. Saul was blinded on the road to Damascus when he met Jesus because blindness is a disorientation. Blindness is a deconstruction of the life that you thought you should live, the life that you thought you were living in, in a good way. And the blindness caused you to, you know, think it through and go, well, I must, maybe that's not exactly the way things are. And so there's this blindness that comes to Elimus. And, and, and maybe the blindness is just an opportunity for Elimus to think, you know what, I, this sorcery power that I've been using, it seems like there's a greater power. Maybe I need to reorient my life around the God that Paul is presenting. So maybe Paul is actually being kind to Elimus. But there are two things that are going on here, and let me explain them quickly because my time, my time is up. But, but, but there's a wineskin through which all of this is happening. According to organizational theory, one is a modality and one is a sodality. Modality and sodality. So when I use the word modality, the root word of that is mode. There's a mode of the church. The church mode 
exist with all these protocols. So Antioch is living as, they're living in this broad, customary way of ministering to the Lord. They're having the Lord's Supper. They, they're teaching the Bible pretty much regularly. They have prayer meetings. People are being added to the church daily as they believe. So the church, the church, Antioch, is stewarding the location of God's activity. They have a structure. They have a modality. This is the place. We'll do it this way. But then alongside the modality is a sodality, and the sodality has to do with everyone that is participating in the large group also carries a narrow scope, a specific assignment. We need some boots on the ground in Patmos because that's where Elimus is. That's where Bar Jesus is. So we need somebody there that can make spontaneous decisions without having to get the committee to approve what you need to do out there on the field. We need, we need the modality of a secure place that's teaching the Bible and growing up the prophetic un- support by which we can send somebody and then we're going to send them so that they can make quality decisions out there on the field, in the classroom, in the businesses that accomplish the, pur- the purpose for which they were sent. Does that make sense? I- I'm trying to get you to see that we here at Trinity Church We are identifying with over 2,000 years of continuity. 2,000 years of continuity and church strategy. We we have a location. We have a... We have a building, we do the same thing pretty much week after week after week. And we become a location where people can be added to the church daily. We are stewarding spiritual activity, but we are sending to campuses and classrooms and New Zealand and Bishop Arts and Fair Park and Kona and foster system in Ukraine and Vietnam and on and on and on. We're sending the poems of God. We're sending the poems to the locations where others can be blessed the way we've been blessed. Uh, If I had time, I would read Ashland's report, just the one that they just finished a week of special emphasis where 500 people heard the gospel and many healings and there was freedom from sexual disorientations and addictions, just so many things happened in Bishop Arts. We weren't there, but we were there because we had sent and the Holy Spirit had sent and, and this explains why next week we'll have faith promises. We'll, we'll ask for missions commitments. To, that's why we'll have a one day offering. That's why we'll structure prayer. That's why we'll do all these things because it's not just about us. It's about It's about participating with the sending nature of God. And I just want to, the question is not, will I participate in the sending strategy? The question is, how will I participate in the sending strategy? And I I want to close with four guiding principles, four guiding principles. And if you won't leave, when you stand, I'll ask you to stand because they're really short. Would you stand? Stand, please. Stand. Four guiding principles. Are you ready? Guiding principle number one. Only in God's economy can you plant seed in someone else's field and reap a harvest in your own. Guiding principle number two. When we, talking about the modality of Trinity Church, when we release workers to another field, we receive workers to our own. I've seen that happen for 29 years. Number three, when we share the gospel with someone else, we are strengthened with a clearer lens of our own. And number four, everyone is involved. We must understand how we participate in the sending nature of God. Somebody give Jesus praise. Would you do it right now? God, we bless you. We honor you. We love you. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for meeting us. Thank you that you're a living God. You're a real God. You're not a concept. You're not a doctrine. You're not a creed. Oh, God. You're alive. You're real. And we get to meet with you. I'm going to close our time together with prayer. Would you 
bow your heads, please? I felt very specifically by the Holy Spirit today that I should pray for anyone who would give me permission to pray over them because you've never really trusted God to the point of relying on him for your life's plans. I feel like there's a lot of people who have trusted God for forgiveness of sins, but you, though you've trusted him as Savior, you've never trusted him as the Lord. To trust him as the Lord means he has a direction, he has a destiny, he has a, a purpose over your life, and to trust him with that, to say, Lord, I trust you to send me, I trust you to put me in the strategic place of your kingdom. I'd love to pray for anyone today who would have the courage and the honesty to say, Pastor, you can pray for me because I've never trusted at that level where he actually orders my steps, where he actually arranges my circumstances. Or maybe there's someone here today that would say, Pastor, I know all, I know what you're talking about. When you talk about a call, I, I, there was an away, I met the living God once and I was like, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say. But if I'm candid about my spiritual condition right now, I'm weary, I'm compromised, I'm, I'm living isolated from the mission of my life. And I just want to pray because I believe God wants to restore the awareness, of, the awareness of destiny over your life. And there might be somebody here, thirdly, who would just say, Pastor, I'm doing the best I can but I need fresh breath. I need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, I'd love to pray for you. So who has the courage and the honesty to just say, Pastor, please pray for me because though I've trusted him for the forgiveness of my sins, I'm ready to trust him for my life. Clearly, life is too complex for me to live it by myself. I wanna trust the Lord to order my steps. If there's anyone that would say, Pastor, Please pray for me because I want to trust him with my whole life. Would you just lift your hands? One, two, three. Say, pray for me. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. How many of you are in the room today and you say, Pastor, honestly, I understand about the call. I know that everyone who belongs to the Lord has a call in their life, but I am living so detached and so weary and so beat up right now that I, I wish you would pray that there would just be a fresh invigoration of intimacy with God's heart so that I could represent him to, to others around me. Lift your hands, one, two, three, say that's me, pray for me. Yeah, God bless.